January 2021 and lockdown number three in the UK. I was fortunate enough this morning to spend an hour on Zoom with the one and only Jamie Moses, a guitarist who for much of the past three or four decades has spent much time on stage with the good and the great of rock and roll. With Jamie being a great friend of the Queen fan club and BrianMay.com, we focused on his extensive work with Queen, and I really hope you enjoy this interview just half as much as Dan Dunmore and I did in putting it together. We started the interview by going right back to 1979 to ask Jamie what he recalled about playing in the pit with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra during a performance by the Royal Ballet of Crazy Little Thing Called Love and Bohemian Rhapsody by one Freddie Mercury. The main story of that of that that day was that um, he that we did a rehearsal with Fred and it was fantastic and there was like the just the core band is myself uh, drums bass guitar keyboards I think that was it just like the four of us during the day it, it, and we were sitting in the pit and Fred was up on stage just kind of singing and walking around the stage dressed in jeans and t-shirts I recall and. Um, and he said, "No, it's all. It's wonderful." He says, "You, you it sounds sounds fabulous. It sounds fabulous." So I'll see you tonight. So we went, "Yeah, yeah, great." Had a little chat with him, which which was really really nice. He, he seemed such. A, that was the only time I ever actually met him and spoke with him, um, and he seemed like such a nice guy. You know, I remember coming away with the impression, "This is a, a really good guy." You know, and so we we come back in the evening, all togged up, and we're in the pit with the Royal Philharmonic. And I'm looking around thinking, wow, this is quite something. And uh, Dame Margaret Fontaine is up in the Royal Box, um, and along with, I don't know, Joan Collins, who, who knows, but loads of celebs there. And this, the conductor stands up on the podium and he goes, looks at me and starts waving this stick around for a crazy little thing called love. I'm going, looking at everybody, going, <laughs> you know, and they're going, then they're going, play, play. I went, well, oh, right. Okay, so I, so I started going down, 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 and of course, I don't know what the, now. I know what this means. It's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That's the downbeats too. And so now I know this. I was only, I was in my early twenties, I think, at the time, and everybody did, fortunately just fell in with what I was doing, and the conductor corrected himself to go with me. Fred, Fred would have been completely unaware of this. He was standing in his in his tutu and his tights or whatever it was he was wearing. Um, <laughs> so just waiting to dance with the Royal Ballet on stage, yeah, you know, sure. which, is, which is what was going on. Um, and, and it was all it was all fine in the end. But that moment, that one moment when I realized we never rehearsed it with the orchestra. Nobody yeah, told yeah. me that a conductor would look at me and go one, two, three, four. Da -da 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 I suppose they figured they wouldn't have to tell me that I was bright enough <laughs> But they were wrong. <laughs> and you were already a Queen fan at that point, were you? Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Well, you see, I had a band called Merlin in the uh, mid-70s, early to mid-70s. Now, somewhere there's an article, the newspaper, The Melody Maker. Well, they did a uh, like a, a two-page spread comparing CBS band Merlin with EMI band Queen. We were both around at the same time. And they compared, you know, our singer with Fred... Right. Me with Brian, so on, sort of all all the way down. They call it hype in the pop market about the the, the record companies promoting these two bands and the and the and uh, you know what you do to get exposure with both the bands. So it was a direct comparison one to the other, and um, and of course one band had a bit more success than the other. <laughs> but but I, I remember when I first started with Brian. Uh, you know, a sort of a week or two weeks into rehearsal, I happened to mention to him, I said, I, I said, I used to play with a band called Merlin. He went, Merlin? You were in Merlin? He said, we were worried about you at one point. I said, oh, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, you needn't have been. <laughs> so your first interaction with Brian, Roger and John was when you were playing with Bob Geldof at the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert at Wembley. Yeah, no, the only one I met at that gig was Brian okay. because Spike, he took me, he says, come on, he says, I want you to, to meet Brian. You know, it'd be good for, good for you to meet Brian. He said, you'll love him. And, uh, and I said, yes, that would be fantastic. So he took me back into Brian's dressing room and I went, it's Brian May, you know, and I met him. I was just nearly shaking. He's, he's wonderful, 
I remember going out. Well, I, at the time, my, my daughter Katie was, um, she would have been 11. Yeah. I remember going out to see Metallica. Were they on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went out and put her on my shoulders. And we were quite near the front because we came out from the backstage area just to the, to the front there. I said, there, oh, this would be fun, you know. And she's on my shoulders, and they, they started out and went crying it like at a million decibels. And I went, ah! and I stuck my, my hands over Katie's ears and then just ran to the backstage area again. <laughs> no. So you didn't get to meet John Deacon then? Not then, but he, he did play with us with the SAS band at the, uh, what was it called? Bottom Line? Shepherd's Bush? I think it was next door, next door to the Empire. And what was your impression of John? Fantastic. He's, yeah. a, he's a really, he's a fantastic bass player, you know. Yeah. He's, he's so creative and great sound and precise. Bang on the money, you know. So although a seed had been sown in Brian's dressing room at Wembley, uh, Mike Caswell had played in the Brian May Band rehearsal tour of South America in 1992. So how did it come about for your role in 1993? Well, I, I don't know. I just know that I got a call from Spike saying, you know, they had done this and as an experiment, and Brian wanted to rejig the band. So, uh, you know, he was getting different backing singers and um, and a guitar player in to see, okay. see, what, see what was going to going, happen. Um, yeah. Did you have to audition for the, the part or was it just- the I, did. There, I did, I yeah. did, yeah, at, at um, Nomus Studios in, in London. I'll always remember it. And I said to Brian, after the audition because he was saying oh get, get a lovely sound you know he's looking at my equipment my sadly old fender app and, and, a, and a marshall amp actually and uh i said oh thank, thanks a lot kind of things and <laughs> don't just imagine yourself um and uh we had a really nice play it was great it went all went very well and at the end i said to him i said i'm just i've got to say this and i'm honestly not blowing smoke up your ass but if i don't get the gig if we just and we never see each other again, at least I can say I've played with you, and and you're definitely one of the top five guitar players ever, ever, in my book. So yeah. so thanks for just having a having a play with me, you know. Fantastic. And as it yeah. turned out, you know, he said, "Well, okay." And Spike said, "Well, you go and wait outside in the corridor." And he came back. And said, well, when we when do you want to start? Then why? <laughs> so Brian's described fronting a band for the first time as a whole re-education process. So what was it like to witness that firsthand? Um, well, full marks to him, full marks to him, because he obviously, you know, he, he hadn't done it before. And one of the reasons I was there, as he made clear to me, was that some of this stuff, as is always the case when you get a brilliant instrumentalist, they're brilliant because they focus everything into it, you know? Yeah. And... Um, and he couldn't do that if he was fronting and this band and and singing. That this is two things. This this is two jobs. Yeah. It's you know. So that's to do three jobs is a bit a bit of an ask, you know. So um, that's why I was there to cover some of the bits he couldn't do while he was singing, and to do some of the harmony stuff and cover some of the other parts that are on the records when he's got twenty five guitars going on, you know. Yeah. Cool. It's, uh, um, yeah. Uh, but seeing him do that, um, I, you know, I had no idea that he had the vocal range that he's got, for instance. Okay. He's, he's re he can really go sing very high. Yeah. I'm very impressed. What you've said about the, um, you know, the buzz of playing with, with Brian May. Was his playing what you would have expected then in terms of guitar? Well, there was a couple of there, there was a couple of ah, so that's how he does it moments, right? Um, which uh, which is all very enlightening. A lot of it, I had a good idea about how he did it, um, but I, most of it is just it's in here and uh, and in here. I mean, his technique is fantastic, yeah. uh, but it's also the tunes, the melodies in his head that he puts down as guitar lines and the sound of his guitar and the various sounds of his guitar that he gets yeah it's just it's just you know i, I give my left arm for it <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't do me much good would it um yeah no i he's he's, he's just fantastic um yeah
And you, you had to learn to play a red special replica then, like I see the one over your right shoulder. That's the one I ended up using, yeah. His one is just got the neck, it's like a tree trunk. The depth of the neck, you know, from front to back. It's, it's, this one is, it was made for my specifications, but the, his one is about that deep. I, I have sound checked his, his one before when he, he couldn't come and sound check, he didn't want to do something. And uh, so he gave it to me to, to sound check. And it's one thing you know, notice when you, as soon as you open it up, you turn the volume up, the volume's down, you, there's this going on from his amps. And as soon as that volume toggles up, it goes because with the feedback, because there's so much gain on it. There's so much level. Yeah. It just, and which is how the, where all that sustain and that beautiful tone comes from. Um, I, we did a gig with Pavarotti in, in Milan, and um, he he said the Pavarotti's guy came over and and said something to Brian, and Brian came back to me and he was looking a bit troubled during rehearsals. He was looking a bit troubled, confused. And I said, what's, what's up? What's going on? He said, well, he said, the, the maestro has asked me to, Pavarotti, has asked me if I can turn down, please. To, to a bit loud for him, you know. And uh, and, he's, and I said, well, you, I said, you can't do that. I said, that's, I, everybody knows that's how you get your sound. The amp is on or off, you know. So it's on and it's full volume. And that's where his fantastic sound comes from. Yeah. yeah. So, you, so you can't do that. I, he said, oh, I know. He said, well, I don't know what to do. He said, seriously, what, you do what I do. I said, you go over to your amp, you pretend to turn it down, turn around and go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and when it, when, when it came to, to playing it, he, he went, because it, it was too much love. He's doing, I'm just a shadow of the man I used to be. And, and he does all this and then, Brown best man comes in and Pavarotti's hair goes whoosh from the back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. I just tell you something about this guitar, by the way. <clears throat> you know, Brian said, if there's anything you want in particular on it, it's different from the, then uh, just let me know and uh, or let them know and they'll, and they'll sort it out. <clears throat> so with, with Brian's, this, his volume control is here right at the back. So he's playing and you'll see him doing that all the time, which is a long way. Now on a Stratocaster, which is what I use mostly, the volume control is here. So I said, any chance you could put the volume control there instead of there, which they've done, as you can see. Yeah, yeah. And this one, and that, so this, which was the volume control, is now the yeah, DFA yeah. knob, um, which on the forums people were saying, I wonder what the DFA is. Well, it's disconnected. It, it does f all. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when it was first given to me, you know, we, we turned up sound check and Brian came along and saw it and he said, oh, nice, nice. He said, hold on. He said, what's that? He said, I said, what's well, the volume control? I said, I asked him to move it to there so that you can still play and still work the volume because you can do it like this, see? With your little finger and, and he said he said oh, what, a, what a great idea i should have done that with mine <laughs> you still play it um sometimes i use it like the queen songs with the ss band or or um and i use it for recording because it's got some nice different sounds on it if you with the out of phase switches for the pickups so how would you describe the dynamics between brian and the band it was it was terrific he seemed to be having the time of his life having his own band. But at the same time, he was part of something new, which um, he, he liked and part of, he obviously likes being in a band and not being a solo act. I mean, it was called the Brian May Band, you know, not Brian May. So. Yeah. He, I, I think he really liked that being one of the boys kind of thing, you know. With a viewing audience of millions, what was it like to play with the Brian May Band and Slash on the Jay Leno show? <laughs> we again, we did a, a rehearsal. We rehearsed, and the and Slash 
had a fag on. You know, he came came in with his top hat and all this stuff and, to rehearsals, and uh, and and the floor manager goes, I, I, "No, I'm sorry, there's no no smoking in here, Mr. Slash." You know, and I went, okay. So he put it out, you know, and we ran through, tie your mother down, and um, and then we came to do the the show that night, and. Brian starts down and and I can see just off in the wings, just just right next to me, but with a curtain in front, so the punters can't see him. It's Flash, and he's standing there looking at me, and he goes, takes that, <laughs> lights it up, and goes, <laughs> and he comes bounding, and I saw the floor manager go, ah. <laughs> um, and it comes. So jumping forward to 1998, what? Can you tell us about your performance on Slow Down on the Another World album? I mean, looking back on that, my big regret is that I didn't. I think Brown might have sprung it on me that I was going to do a solo. Go on, just do a solo. Had I had time, I would have actually worked on it and constructed something a bit better. Like I did with the solo and Let Your Heart Rule Your Head. That right. I actually took time to, okay, I'll do that there. And then there's this little phrase I can put there. I didn't do with the slow down thing, but mind you, it is rock and roll, isn't it? So, and of course, Cozy Powell's passing after the recording of Another World must have been pretty devastating for you all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember um, Spike called me about it, and I was in B and Q or somewhere, and he said, "Jay, I got some really bad news." So, where are you? Sit down, you know. And I found a place and I sat. And I said, "What? What's going on? What's going on?" And he told me, I went, "Oh." Because it was just so sudden, obviously. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He, he, he was quite a big part of the band, I guess, with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. A big noise. And yes, but also as a, as a character, as a person, you know, he was hilarious. He used to he used to sit up. If I got up during the night on the tour bus in America, and I'd go to, I'd see two people talking at the front at like four or five in the morning, and it would be him sitting with a bus driver. Really? Looking at sh shouting at other motorists, you know, get out of the way, what's the matter with you? On behalf of the driver. <laughs> what do you remember about the handful of unplugged shows ahead of the main Another World Tour? We did, uh, yeah, we did. We had Steve Ferroni on, on percussion on some of those from, you know, Average White Band and Chuck Khan's band yeah. and everything. He's, he's brilliant, brilliant. They came over really well, the VH1 one, which obviously was good production that's out, out there. It seemed really cool. Tie Your Mother Down, just one of my favourites from there. It's a nice feel, that, isn't it? Yeah. It's that... Um, it's that... Um... That's it. <laughs> doing that in the studio and one of those I was playing the riff and Brian said what's that you're playing I said it's one of your songs I can't remember I can never remember if it's Tie Your Mother Down or Hammer to Fall so I was messing around things oh that's nice come on you know let's and um yeah it, it, it kind of developed into I'm not saying that it was my idea but yeah, but it developed from there perhaps yeah 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 it was just we sat down started playing that and everybody just fell into playing different parts and and uh it really worked yeah after another world was it a surprise to you that brian stepped away from fronting his own band effectively disbanding the brian may band no not really i was i was always wondering if queen were going to resurface as queen yeah. if you know roger and well and john in fact would just find another singer and and it, but um I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> okay. So, retrospect these days, how do you look back on your experience with the Brian May band? Oh, I was just over the moon to be involved in, in any way. You know, happy to be in there somewhere, as they say, you know. Um, it was terrific, really, really lovely. 
Was there ever an opportunity for you to be involved with the house band for We Will Rock You at the Dominion? That was the original intention was that I was going to be a guitar player in it. Um, Because Brian said, he said, we're we're working on this musical. Um, And uh, he said, look, I know it's not your kind of your thing. Because I'm not really that big on musicals. But he said, "Um, but if you'd like to play guitar in it, you know, that would be great. Uh, And I said, "Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Lovely. So, and then lo and behold, it actually came to light that they had written the musical. Um, and they said, you, you know, you have to audition for it because it's, there's, there's Ben Elton and De Niro and everybody's involved in it. So we know that you're suitable for it, but the, they don't. So, so I did go on an audition and they, I got the, the gig. Um, but I, and a couple of weeks later, I had to say to him, so I'd say, listen, this is, I'm really sorry, Brian, you're absolutely right. It's not for me. The music, whole idea of going to a musical every night, punching the clock, doing all that, it's not why I started playing the guitar. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to have to hand it over. But I know somebody else who can do it, and I put Laurie Weisfield up for it. And, uh, and there you go, the rest is history. How was it to play at the first 46664 concert for Nelson Mandela in Cape Town? Oh, that's terrific. That was a terrific thing because, I mean, all the other acts, the legendary acts that were on with us, uh, which I can't remember any at the moment, but because we did so, we did about, did about seven of those. And, um, and you know, with Peter Gabriel and Robert Plant and uh, U2, Andy Lennox. Um, so it was, a, it was a fantastic gig. They all were, those 4 triple six four ones. They were... Well, I mean, Christ, though, the work that went into them for us as the house band, because not only was I playing with Queen and Spike, um, but we were in the house band for all the other acts. So for each one of those, we had to learn 40, 45 songs. I've still got up on my toilet wall a note from The Edge, which was handed to me 20 minutes before we went on stage, saying, Jamie, sorry for the last minute changes, but in the chorus, could you do it? And in the middle eight, um, and we think it might be better if you did this thing. And I went, oh, no, I can't. Ah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry again, The Edge. <laughs> How did your role in Queen and Paul Rogers come about? I knew that they were auditioning bass players for this Queen and Paul Rogers thing. Um, and I, I play a bit of bass, you know, so <clears throat> I wrote to Brian and said, and I remember the subject of the email said, your pop combo queen. <laughs> In inverted commas, your pop combo queen. And I said, uh, Hi Brian, just to, um, just to let you know that if you're looking for bass players, as it happens, I do play bass because I I play bass with Mike and the Mechanics, for instance. Okay. Um, yeah. And two or three other acts. I, sometimes I play some songs on bass guitar. Right. So uh, and I said the one thing. I I am a bass owner. I said, and I've got and uh, um, you know I play a bit. I know all the the vocals, all the vocal parts, and the songs. Um, so uh, if you're thinking of you know it'd be. I'd be happy to audition for it. So it came to pass that, yes, you, they were doing auditions at Ritz, at, well, anyway, in Putney. And um, and I, I didn't have a decent bass rig, actually. So I, I asked, I rented one, a bass rig, and I borrowed a really nice Fender Precision as well from somebody else, okay. rather than use my scabby old bass. And, and we sat down and had a cup of tea, and we were sitting there, me and... Brian and Rog and Spike, and um, and I was, I was actually really nervous because with guitar, I know exactly what I'm doing. Bass, I'm never quite sure what the sound should be because it sounds so different here to what it does over there, bass guitar. And I'm, guitar, I know exactly what to do with it, but so, and I was kind of getting nervous. Um, and with Paul Rogers there as well, of course, uh, to do his songs, to do the free songs, the bad company things, is, the bass parts are terrific. Yeah. 
so they said, well, let's just sit down and have a chat. And we sat and had a, had a chat. And I'm, I'm bass guitar. I on the stand there. I'm great, waiting to start. He said, um, listen, I do really think maybe we shouldn't have you playing. Maybe you should be playing second guitar instead. I went, well, I, I said, and again, I used that. I'm just happy to be in, be in there somewhere, you know. And they said, yeah, let's do that. And we'll we'll audition. You know, we'll, we'll find another bass player. So it's all right. Okay, brilliant. He said, welcome aboard. And that was, that was how I started. It. it was like, it was never planned. We just sat down and I never even played one note. They said, well, since you got it here, let's play some songs. So we did. So we just had a, had a jam and I, and I played the bass guitar and, um, and and that was that. And was that the first time you met Paul Rogers? Yeah. Actually, I'm not even sure if Paul was there, to tell you the right. truth. Right. It was Brian and Roger and Spike. Um, right. It was just a four piece band you know having a, having a play yeah bit by bit it was happening and um uh, they they were happy having hold the whole idea of queen plus whether it's queen plus well axel rose or whoever it was going to be yeah i think that was the concept and then uh yeah and then they just booked in a few tours for for the queen of paul rogers thing and um that was it so we're playing alongside Paul Rogers with Brian and Roger at the one-off UK Hall of Fame performance in 2004. Was the chemistry really that obvious? Uh, absolutely, no question. Um, for, for a few reasons. I mean, well, one, when we when we played and we were, I was walking through the car park with Brian to go to the truck where they were recording it from, the outside, the truck outside. And as we were walking across there, and he said, I think something special happened just then. And I said, I think you might be right, you know. And he said, mm, this might be worth pursuing. And, that was, and then it became Queen of Paul Rogers. Um, yeah, but also, apparently, Freddie was a huge um, Free and Paul Rogers fan. And Brian and Rod certainly are as well. Okay. So, you know, they, they felt that Freddie would have approved of yeah. having Paul in the band. You were a fan, were you, of Paul Rogers? Oh, huge fan, huge fan of Free. I mean, know all that stuff. It's it's just it's in my blood, and I, and the you know all stuff like wishing well, my brother Jake. We never did my brother Jake, which is a real shame. But I like yeah. done that. My brother Jake, the piano on that. Doom, doom, yeah, doom. yeah, yeah. Um, and Bad Company loved loved all of that stuff. No, so it's pretty good to play the, those songs that you did in terms of wishing well. Huge honor, huge honor. Okay. And I and, and it turns out Brian made me know all those parts. And it was really funny when we go to play them for the first time. I mean, and Brian would both go for the same riffs and the same little chord patterns and stuff. And, and you were obviously always credited with backing vocals for the Brian May Band and for Queen and Paul Rogers. Yeah. But the yeah. harmonies were pretty important. To the yeah, oh, completely. Re really important. In fact, I remember us being pretty pissed off once because one of the reviews said, um, unfortunately, they were using... Pre-recorded backing vocals. Okay. No, we weren't. <laughs> that was a, we made it too good. Yeah, the people they thought that it must be on track or something. But we spent a lot of time, a lot of time on on vocals. And but Paul was never that. He never got involved really in backing vocals. He, he didn't. If they weren't there, he didn't care. If they were, fine. If they were singing different parts on the record, whatever. You know. Whereas Brian and Raj, bang, they know every note. Uh, what should be sung in what parts yeah uh, and then spike helped with all that do you do you still keep in touch with those band members now paul rogers and obviously brian and roger no not paul um although i had a, a christmas email from him saying you know, merry christmas you know but uh but brian and rog yes yeah all the time what did you make of paul's vocal takes on the queen songs well i i, I thought the same as the guys did which is that he kind of put he I, I seem to remember Brian saying at one point that the songs were reborn with him because it wasn't like he was trying to copy Freddie or even just to sing the tunes as they were. He put the, uh, this blues slant on them. And everybody went, wow, oh, okay. And for me, I loved it. I know a lot of people didn't, but I think a, an awful lot of people did. I mean, he's, you know, he's, Adam Lambert's got something different. He's a real showman. He's flamboyant and everything. Um, but Paul, if you if you just listen to that voice, in my book, he could just sing anything. He could sing the phone book, and it would sound yeah, fantastic. Nothing really matters to me.
And what can you tell us about the experience of playing alongside Roger Taylor? Well, can you imagine anybody else playing with Queen, playing those songs? I can't. You know, he's he's got that he's got that Jesus. He can really lay into those drums. He's he's just he's just brilliant. You know, yeah. uh, powerful powerful drummer. But he puts the right things to the right songs. He plays sympathetically to the songs. Um, and with yeah. the vocal side as well. And the vocal side, of course, yeah. Fantastic vocals. I mean, Brian's got a rage, range, but Roger, my God. How was it to perform in front of those huge audiences at Freedom Square in Ukraine and Hyde Park, for example? Yeah, that well, it was something. It was about 320,000 people, was it? Yeah, it was a huge gig. And fortunately, it went very well. And I remember not being nervous, weirdly, where I should have been, but... Um, and uh, yeah, I was very happy. We we, we came off having said, "Well, that was fun, wasn't it?" Yeah. And when you look back and you see it from the air as well, it, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of it all in two thousand and eight, was it a surprise to you when the Queen and Paul Rogers collaboration came to an end? Um, it was. It was more. I would say more of a disappointment than a surprise. But um, yeah. yeah. It's a shame because we were just we were kind of getting into our stride, but um, but uh, it it just it reached its natural end. I think that's okay. that's that's the point. But everyone was still getting on well. It was just oh yeah, uh, oh no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, everybody was 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 fine. Uh, just um, it's just that other people wanted to move on. That's all. And in retrospect, now how do you look back on that experience of playing with Queen and Paul Rogers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, love it. Yes, really love it. So moving on from Paul Rogers, it sounded earlier like you're quite a fan of the Queen and Adam Lambert collaboration. Yeah, the Adam Lambert thing is, is brilliant. It's really brilliant. He's, He's really brought something to the band and took it, taken it back a bit more to what it was with Fred. Um, and everybody's playing and singing really well with that, with that lot. Um, and it's the same as it was with us. I, I you know, I don't think there's anything on on track vocally, um, but uh, which is which is a real credit to them. Um, I've been to a couple of those shows. Uh, very impressed. Yeah, very impressed with it all. Good, great production. Yeah. Was there ever a chance for you to be involved then when they came together in 2012? I was, well, I was wondering about it, but Brian actually did, said to me, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry that you're not involved in this. He says, it's just that I'm more confident as a singing guitar player without Fred now than, you know, before he'd lost Fred. Um, and he needed, and, it's, and without John as well, he needed something to to make it a bit fuller, maybe. But yeah. uh, now he's got. So I mean, at least I wasn't replaced with another guitar player. Yes. You know, yeah. um, it's just they don't have second guitar now, sure. uh, and I understand that completely. So it's still a six-piece band. It's just that instead of second guitar, they have percussion, stroke, drums. It's fine. I would, I would, I would have liked to have been involved, but there you go. And of course, you were a founder member of the SAS band back in 1994, when the Brian May band was, I believe, taking a, a small hiatus. No, it's exactly right. We knew that Brian was going to take a break after the, that first tour. And we said, well, well, this is a really good band. It's really happening band. We, it'd be a shame to let it go to waste. Why don't we just get some guest singers in to sing? So we got Chris Thompson in as our main singer. Um, and we took the girls from, from the Brian May band. And other than that, it was Neil Murray and Cozy. Um, and Spike and me. Yeah, it was basically the Brian May band without Brian. And then we started getting more guest singers in. We we had Paul Rogers. He, he did one of the one gig with us. He sang My Girl. So I remember he sang it fantastically. Pro, at the bottom line there in uh, 
in Shepherd's Bush, I think it was. But we've had just about everybody sing with that band. Yeah. That is strange when you when you get the guys, when you get Brian and Raj involved, then it becomes more of a Queen thing. But yeah. then it's Queen without the production and and so on. But then I've done so many where I've, I've Brian has been there and Brian has got up and played with either with uh, well Jamie and the Falcons as it's now called, which used to be called the Red Sox, world famous Red Sox. My party band, this which Spike is in as well. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, with those things, it's really great. We did one, we opened the Fender showroom, um, the artist's showroom in Sussex and with that band. And Brian was there along with Peter Green. And I've got a picture of me standing, just singing. And I've given my guitar to Brian and Peter Green's taking a guitar off the, off the wall. And they're both, and they're having a jam. I mean, what's that? What is that? That's fantastic, isn't it? Have you enjoyed guesting at the Queen Fan Club conventions over the years? Yeah, just loads. Always, always fun that. Um, yeah, and you never know what's going to happen there, really. Uh, you never know who's going to get up and and sing and play. And yeah, I've had some very funny moments there doing those. But the fans have always um, been respectful. Yeah. Oh, completely. Completely, yeah. Which it's it's nice that, and then afterwards, you know, I get to go out and get, go and stand at the bar and have a drink. I don't think I've ever bought a drink there. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, let me get you a drink. Oh, all right then. <laughs> so, having worked firsthand with Brian for so much of the past three decades, how would you summarise his prowess on guitar? Oh, well, he's the, he's the, he's the best, isn't he? He is unique, and you know it's him. That's the thing. He's picked up my guitar, my shitty old Strat, and he's played five notes. And you, in, using my sound, my guitar, and you go, "That's Brian May." You can tell it. Yeah. Even without the red special. Yes. Yes. You just know it's him. He's just got such a beautiful touch, and he can make it just scream and explode, and the most delicate of touches on the string. Uh, which melt your heart is is uh, unique. And if you had to summarise the whole experience of your Queen-related work over the past three decades, the, the, these guys—they're rock gods for a reason, you know. They deserve every ounce of praise uh, and reward, you know, financial and artistic. They deserve all of it. So what can you tell us about your current activities, obviously pre-COVID and current activities and what you've got planned for, for the future? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm self-unemployed at the moment. But, um, well, you know, everybody is. There, there's just nothing happening, is there now? Um, but uh, we've, I've got this Los Pacaminos, uh, you know, with Paul Young, that thing, which has yeah. been together for 28 years now. Um, so we're, we're aching to get back on the road with that. Um, I've got my party band, Jamie and the Falcons, which Spike is in, um, Jamie Little on drums and Steve Stroud on bass. It's a, that's a fantastic band. It's a cracking band, that one. Um, available for birthdays, weddings, bar mitzvahs. I, st I still do the occasional thing with Mike and the Mechanics. I'm doing a Christmas album. Uh, and I do this thing on a Sunday called Live from Jamie's House, where every Sunday at six o'clock on my Facebook page, my Facebook band page, which I think is called Jamie Moses Guitar, um, I just do some stuff here in my studio. Little darling, it seems like years since it's been here. Here comes the sun, do 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 do. Here comes the sun. It's all right. um, and sing some stuff, some to, to a couple of backing tracks, but a lot of it's just on acoustic guitar or electric guitar on my own. And um, any any songs that I really like to do, I just play them. And I do that for an hour. So live from Jamie's house. So what I've done is a Christmas album called Christmas at Jamie's House. Uh, I didn't get it finished in time for Christmas, so I released it as an EP, which is, and it's on... Um, you know, uh, Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, everything. Christmas uh, from Jamie's house, that's called. Okay. Just four-track EP with, with stuff like Driving Home for Christmas and 
it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, all that stuff, you know. Yeah, fabulous. Which I really enjoy doing it at home, uh, as I've done. And I'm working, I'm finished, and I will have the album finished by next Christmas as well. Well, I think there's all, all that's left, Jamie, is me, on behalf of all Queen fans, to thank you sincerely, not just for your time today, but for being such a big part of so many great nights out over the years. So we hope to see you out there again in the not-too-distant future. Um, all the best in the meantime. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. Cheers. Bye-bye.